And now, I'm not going to say too much because I think you already know the person that's standing behind you. I do want to say this. I've had the store for 11 years, and one author's name has come up again and again from the request from the staff, from the customers, uh, that we would like to get in the store. And we've been asking for 11 years. And we're very excited to have her, Jody Picot. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Um, for those of you who are way in the back, when they clap in the front, it means I said something fun, I guess. So, uh, uh, and congratulations to all of you who made it to the sitting portion here, as opposed to the nosebleed seats. Um, it's very exciting for me to be on book tour for Change of Heart, mostly because it's only day two of the tour. I'm usually not quite this animated, you know, come June or so. But, um, but I'm very excited about this book for a lot of reasons. I've been waiting for it to come out. Um, it takes me about, it's about a year and a half after I finish the book before you guys actually see it. And uh, it's no coincidence that this one is being published during an election year. <laughs> this was very important to me because of what I wanted to address in this book. And when I do my readings, I don't really like to tell you very much about the book because I'd rather surprise you as uh, you're hearing it. But what I will tell you is sort of the genesis of this one. Um, what I've been thinking these days, the thing I've been really worried about during this election year is that it seems to me that you can fold this country on the fault line of religion. And I wanted to know how organized religion, which I think was really meant to unite people, somehow became so divisive. And that was the impetus for me for this particular book. And I don't really want to tell you anything else about it, I've decided. Instead, <laughs> I'm just going to read to you for a few minutes. And uh, what I'll do after my reading is take questions from you guys. Hopefully you can think of some good ones. And to set up for you where I am in the book when I'm doing this reading, I'm going to be reading to you from one of the four narrators in this book. This is Lucius. Lucius is a, um, an inmate at the New Hampshire State Prison in the Maximum Security Unit. And he is relating to you what happens over a series of days when a new inmate named Shea Bourne is brought into the prison and moved into the cell next to him. He's been in a different part of the prison, but he's, he's now been moved into the, the cell next to Lucius. I have no idea where they were keeping Shea Bourne before they brought him to us. I knew he was an inmate here at the state prison in Concord. I can still remember watching the news the day his sentence was handed down, the rough stone of the prison exterior, the golden dome of the state house. His conviction was the subject of great discussion. Where do you keep an inmate who's been sentenced to death when your state hasn't had a death row prisoner for ages? Rumor had it that, in fact, the prison did have a pair of death row cells, not too far from my own humble abode in the secure housing unit on I-Tier. They were stacked with the thin plastic slabs that pass for mattresses here. I wondered for a while what had happened to all those extra mattresses after Shea arrived. One thing's for sure, no one offered to give them to us. As Shea Bourne was escorted in by six correctional officers wearing helmets and flak jackets and face shields, he turned to me. Maybe now would be a good time to tell you what I look like. My face was the reason I sometimes preferred to be hidden in this cell. The sores were scarlet and purple and scaly and spread from my forehead to chin. Most people winced. Even the polite ones did a double take, as if I looked even worse than, he rem than they remembered. But Shea just met my gaze and nodded at me, as if I were no different than anyone else. I pulled out my headphones and turned on my television. It was 5 o'clock and I didn't like to miss Oprah. But when I tried to change the channel, nothing happened. The screen flickered as if it were resetting to channel 22, but channel 22 looked just like channel 3 and channel 5 and CNN and the Food Network. A local network was covering a fundraiser for a nearby children's hospital. The camera zeroed in on a girl with fairy tale blonde hair and blue half moons under her eyes, just the kind of child they televised to get you to open up your wallet. Claire Nealon, the reporter's voiceover said, is waiting for a heart. Boo-hoo, I thought. Everyone's got problems. I took off my headphones. If I couldn't listen to Oprah, I didn't want to listen at all. Which is why I was able to hear Shea Bourne's first word on iTier. Yes, he said. And just like that, the cable came back on. You've probably noticed by now that I'm a cut above most of the Cretans on iTier, and that's because I don't really belong here. 
It was a crime of passion. The only discrepancy is that I focused on the passion part and the courts focused on the crime. <laughs> but I ask you, what would you have done if the love of your life found a new love of his life? Someone younger, thinner, better looking? The irony, of course, is that no sentence imposed by a court for homicide could trump the one that's ravaged me in prison. My last CD4 was taken six months ago, and I was down to 75 cells per cubic millimeter of blood. Someone without HIV would have a normal T cell count of 1,000 cells or more, but the virus becomes part of these white blood cells. The doctors say I won't die from AIDS. I'll die from pneumonia or TB, but if you ask me, that's just semantics. Dead is dead. It was after 3 a.m., but to be honest, I don't sleep much. Instead, I use my insomnia to fuel my artwork. I need to do it, Shaybourne said. It's the only way. I wondered who he was having a conversation with at this hour of night. Maybe he was having a nightmare. Born, I whispered. Are you OK? Who's there? The words were hard for him, not quite a stutter, more like each syllable was a stone he had to bring forth. I'm Lucius, Lucius Dufresne. Lucius, did, did you see on TV today? There, there was this little girl. You mean the fundraiser, the one up at the hospital? That little girl, Shay said. I'm going to give her my heart. Before I could respond, there was a loud crash and the thud of flesh smacking against the concrete floor. Shay? I called. Shay? I couldn't see Shay at all, but I heard something rhythmic smacking a cell door. Hey! I yelled at the top of my lungs. We need help down here. An officer rushed in and knelt in front of Shay's cell. Bourne's having a seizure. He called the EMTs, who pushed an oxygen mask over Shay's mouth. His eyes had rolled up in their sockets, white and blind. Do whatever it takes to bring him back, the officer instructed. And that was how I learned that the state will save a dying man, just so they can kill him later. <laughs> when Shay Bourne returned to ITIR after three days in the hospital infirmary, he was a man with a mission. Every morning, when the officers came to poll us to see who wanted a shower or time in the yard, Shay would ask to speak to Warden Coyne. I just need five minutes with him. Yeah, yeah, you're not the only one with problems, the officer snapped today when he asked. So cool off. All right, Shay replied. I was distracted by a whistling noise coming from my tiny sink. I had no sooner stood up to investigate than the water burst out of the spigot. Now this was remarkable on two counts. Normally the water pressure was no greater than a trickle, even in the showers, and the water that was splashing over the sides of the metal bowl was a deep, rich red. Man, that looks like blood, said Crash, the self-appointed leader of I-Tier. I'm not washing up in that. It's in the toilets too, said Calloway, another inmate. We all knew our pipes were connected. You could actually flush a note down the length of the pod. It would briefly appear in the next cell's bowl before heading out to the sewage system. <laughs> I turned and looked in my toilet. The water was as dark as rubies. Hey, Crash said. It ain't blood, it's wine. Taste it, ladies. Drinks around the house. I did not drink the tap water in here. I had a feeling that my AIDS medications, which came on a punch card, might be some government experiment done on expendable inmates. I wasn't about to imbibe from a water treatment system run by the same administration. But then I heard the other inmates laughing, and the entire mood of the tier changed so radically that an officer's voice boomed over the intercom. What's going on in there? Come on in, CO, Crash said. We'll buy the next round. I dipped my finger into the dark stream that was still running strong from the sink. It could have been iron or manganese, but it was true. This water smelled like sugar and dried sticky. I bent my head to the tap and drank from the flow. If you've been in prison as long as I have, you've experienced a good many innovative highs. I've drunk hooch distilled from fruit juice and bread and Jolly Rancher candies. I've huffed spray deodorant. I've smoked dried banana peels rolled up in a page of the Bible. But this was like none of those. This was honest-to-God wine. By now, the officers realized there'd been some snafu with the plumbing. One of them came onto the tier, fuming. Lucius, what is this? At first, I thought it was a Cabernet officer, but I'm leaning towards a cheap Merlot. <laughs> As he stormed off the tier, we were all laughing. Things that weren't humorous became funny. I didn't even mind listening to Crash. At some point, the wine trickled and dried up, but by then, Crash was singing Danny Boy, and I was fading fast. In fact, the last thing I remember is Callaway challenging Shay to a chugging contest, but Shay saying he'd sit that one out. But actually, he didn't drink. It was late afternoon, almost time for the shift change, and I-Tier was relatively quiet. 
me. I'd been sick all day, hazing in and out of sleep brought on by fever. Calloway, who usually played chess with me, was playing with Shay instead. Last week, Calloway had found a bird's egg on the exercise yard and had hatched it into a pet. During the day, Batman the Robin resided in his breast pocket, a small lump no bigger than a pack of Starburst candies. Sometimes it crawled onto his shoulder and pecked at the scars on his scalp. At other times, he kept Batman in a paperback copy of The Stand. Starting on chapter six, a square had been cut out of the pages of the thick book with a pilfered razor blade, creating a little hollow that Calloway lined with tissues to make a bed. Hey, Calloway said, we haven't made a wager on this game. What have you got that I'd like? He thought for a moment. I want all your dessert for a month, Born. Well, what if I win, Shay asked. Calloway laughed, that won't happen. The bird, I am not giving you Batman. Well, then I'm not giving you my food. Fine, Calloway said. You win, you get the bird. But you're not going to win because my bishop takes d3. Queen to h7, Shay replied. Checkmate. At that moment, the door to i tier opened, admitting a pair of officers in flak jackets and helmets. They marched to Calloway's cell and brought him onto the catwalk, securing his handcuffs to a metal railing along the wall. <coughs> There was nothing worse than having your cell searched. The officers came in with flashlights and long-handled mirrors. They checked the seams of the walls, the vents, the plumbing. They'd roll deodorant sticks all the way out to make sure nothing was hidden underneath. They'd shake containers of powder to hear what might be inside. They'd sniff inside shampoo bottles, open envelopes, and take out the letters. They'd rip off your bed sheets and run their hands over the mattresses, looking for tears or ripped seams. Meanwhile, you were forced to watch. I couldn't see what was going on in Calloway's cell, but when his bookshelf was inspected, Calloway flinched. I looked for the small bulge in his breast pocket that would have been the bird and realized that Batman the Robin was somewhere in that cell. One of the officers held up the copy of the stand and tossed it against the cell wall. What's this, he asked, focusing not on the bird that had been whipped across the cell, but on the baby blue tissues that fluttered down over his boots. The officer said something about a write-up, but Calloway wasn't listening. As soon as he was released back into his cell, he ran to the rear corner where the bird had been flung. The sound that Calloway Reese made was primordial, but then maybe that was always the case when a grown man with no heart started to cry. There was a crash and a sickening crunch. Calloway sank to the floor of his cell, cradling the dead bird. God damn, God damn! Calloway, Shay interrupted. I want my prize. Not now, I hissed. Yes, now, Shay said. A deal's a deal. In here, you were only as good as your word, and Calloway, a card-carrying member of the Aryan Brotherhood, would have known that better than anyone else. You better make sure you're always behind those bars, Calloway vowed, because the next time I get the chance, I'm going to mess you up so bad, your own mama wouldn't know you. But even as he threatened Shay, Calloway gently wrapped the dead bird in a tissue. The robin looked half-cooked, its closed eye translucent blue. One wing was bent at a severe backward angle, its neck lolled sideways. Shay reeled the dead robin into his cell. The lights on the catwalk flickered. I've often imagined what happened next. I like to picture Shay sitting on his bunk, cupping his palms around the tiny bird. In the long run, though, it hardly matters how Shay did it. What matters is the result, that we all heard the piccolo trill of that robin, that Shay pushed the bird beneath his cell door onto the catwalk, where it hopped, like broken punctuation, toward Calloway's outstretched hand. That night, for the first time in six months, I slept through till morning. I woke up rested and relaxed without any of the stomach nodding that usually consumed me for the first two hours of every day. I walked to the basin, squeezed toothpaste onto the stubby brush they gave us, and glanced up at the wavy sheet of metal that passed for a mirror. Something was different. The sores, the Kaposhi sarcoma that had spotted my cheeks and inflamed my eyelids for a, a year now were gone. My skin was clear as a river. I opened up my mouth, tugged my lower lip, searching in vain for the blisters that kept me from eating. Lucius, I heard, a voice spilling from the vent over my head. Good morning. I glanced up. It is Shay. God, yes, it is. In the end, I didn't have to call for a medical consult. The officer was shocked enough at my improved appearance to call Alma, the prison nurse, himself. All right, your CD4 is 1250, Alma said, and your viral load's undetectable. That's good, right? It's normal. It's what someone who doesn't have AIDS would test. I'm sure there's a medical explanation. It's Shay. 
inmate born? He did this, I said, well aware of how insane it sounded and desperate to make her understand. I saw him. I saw him bring a dead bird back to life. He made wine come out of the faucets the first night he was here. Yeah, okay, let's see if we can get a psych consult. <laughs> I'm not crazy, Alma. I'm, I'm healed. I reached for her hand. Haven't you ever seen something with your own eyes that you never imagined possible? Alma walked out of my cell and stood in front of Shay's. What do you know about inmate Dufresne's condition? He, he, he can't sleep much, Shay said quietly. It hurts him to eat. Well, he's got AIDS. But suddenly this morning, that's all changed, Alma said. And for some reason, he thinks you had something to do with it. I, I didn't do anything. Alma turned to the officer. Did you see any of this? Traces of alcohol were found in the plumbing on I-tier, the officer admitted. But born cells been tossed religiously, and we've never found any contraband. I didn't do anything, Shay repeated. But suddenly, he grew animated. Are you here for my heart? What? My heart. I want to donate it after I die. He gave Alma a piece of paper. This is the girl who needs it. I wrote her name down. I, I don't know anything about that. But you can find out. You can talk to the right people. Alma's voice went soft as flannel, the way she used to speak to me when the pain was so great I couldn't see past it. I can talk, she said. It is an odd thing to be watching television and know that in reality it's happening right outside your door. Crowds had flooded the parking lot of the prison. Camping out on the stairs of the parole office entrance were folks in wheelchairs, elderly women with walkers, mothers clutching sick infants to their chests. Lining the street that led past the cemetery in downtown were the news fans. The reporter on screen faced the camera. Bob, so far there's been no confirmation or denial from the administration that any miraculous behavior has in fact taken place within the Concord State Prison. We have been told, however, by an unnamed source that all of this stemmed from the desire of New Hampshire's sole death row inmate, Shea Bourne, to donate his organs post-execution. <coughs> Just then an officer arrived, escorting someone we rarely saw. Warden Coin, A burly man with a flat top on which you could have served dinner, he stood outside Shea's cell. How'd you make the wine? He demanded. You hypnotized them into believing they were getting something they weren't? I know about mind control, Born. I didn't do anything, <laughs> Shea murmured. I'm watching you, the warden hissed. I know what you're up to. You know damn well your heart isn't going to be worth anything once it's pumped full of potassium chloride in a death chamber. You're doing this because you've got no appeals left, but even if you get Barbara freaking Walters to do an interview with you, the sympathy vote's not going to change your execution date. The warden stalked off eye tear, leaving the officer behind. Staring at Shay, he reached inside the neck of his shirt, pulling out a crucifix. He brought it to his lips and let it fall beneath his uniform again. He that believeth on me, the officer murmured, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. I didn't know the New Testament, but I recognized a biblical passage when I heard one, and it didn't take a rocket scientist to realize that he was suggesting Shay's antics, or whatever you wanted to call them, were heaven sent. I sat down on my bunk. That wasn't possible, was it? Water into wine, raising the dead, healing the sick. I pulled my art supplies out from my hiding spot and rifled through my sketches for the one I'd done of Shea after his seizure. I'd drawn him on the EMT's gurney, arms tied down, legs banded together. This time, though, I turned the paper 90 degrees. Suddenly, it didn't look like Shea was lying down. It looked like he was being crucified. People were always finding God in jail. What if he was already here? Thank you. <laughs> change of heart. Lots more to look forward to in that one, I hope. Um, and I am happy now to take questions about anything. Presumably you haven't all finished the book yet, because it's only been out for a day. It doesn't have to be about this book. But uh, it could be about anything at all. The only thing I would ask is that if you have a question about the end of a book, give it in, say the question in big global terms so you don't give it away for someone who hasn't finished it yet. So does anyone have a question for me? Raise your hand. I can talk about this so well without telling you the ending of this book. I've become gifted at it. Um, OK, so. I'm going to tell you a story first about My Sister's Keeper. My Sister's Keeper was the first book of mine that any of my children ever read. And my son, my oldest son, is 16 now, but he was 12 when he read the book. And he was very excited about it <coughs> because he, um, he was reading it. He was the same age as some of the characters.
think he had a crush on some of them. And he came home from school one day and he said, Mom, Mom, I only have 15 pages left. And I thought, oh, great. And he sat down on the couch and he was reading it. And all of a sudden I look over and he's got the book on his chest and he's got tears streaming down his face. And he ran up to his room and he slammed the door. And uh, I went up after him and I knocked and I said, Kyle, let's talk. And he opened the door and he said, I don't want to talk to you right now. <laughs> I know you all felt that way. <laughs> what I will tell you is what I told him, and he came around to seeing my point of view, and probably you did eventually too if you're here, um, but uh, it is a brutal ending for that book. You knew on page one it wouldn't be a happy ending. Um, however, it is the right ending for that book. It is the only one that will shock that family out of a cycle of self-destruction. Otherwise, any other ending, and believe me, I thought of other ones, um, they'll make the same mistakes over and over and over again. Ultimately, this is the ending that makes you realize that when you are looking so far ahead to what's coming, you forget what's right in front of you. And that was the message I wanted to leave you with. So I know you were upset, but you'll get over it. <laughs> yes? Why did I not have Emily tell Chris about McDonald's in the pack? Um, are you so sure she didn't? Go back and reread it. <laughs> Go back and reread the, the book and look for the flashback of what happens in McDonald's and then look immediately to see what happens in the present. She is sending a note in her tin can and that note breaks. We'll never know what's in that note, neither will Chris. Oh, yeah. That's a great question, actually. I, I don't think I've ever been asked that. Um, it's the idea that a lot of the time I will assign a career to someone who, that has great bearing on their life in some way and affects their, their decisions. And yes, um, absolutely in this book, because one of the four narrators, you heard from Lucius, one of the other narrators here is Father Michael, who is called in to uh, talk some sense into this nutcase who wants to donate his heart after ex his execution by the prison, and talk to him about redemp what redemption's really supposed to be. But Father Michael arrives just at about the time that all this is going on, and he could think of one other guy who was 33 years old, a former carpenter with a death sentence on his head, and you know was performing miracles, and things didn't work out well that time either. And he begins to not talk to Shay, but to listen very carefully to what he says. And, uh, and Michael has a, a secret that he's hiding from Shay, which you'll really discover almost on page one. Um, and uh, Michael has turned to religion because of, of that secret, because of what he's hiding, uh, and really has to think very hard about why we believe what we do. Is it because it's right, or is it because it's just too darn scary to think we might not have the answers? Um, questions about legal stuff in my books. And you know, the truth is I'm not a lawyer. I don't play one on TV. The more I research it, the more happy I am that I'm not a lawyer. I keep waiting for someone to give me an honorary JD, but that hasn't happened yet either. Um, and the truth is that when I write about the law, which is not true of every book, actually. There are many books that don't have a trial in them. But if I am writing about something legal, it's usually because I have discovered something so patently ridiculous about the American legal system that I feel the need to tell it all to you. <laughs> and, um, and there are many examples of that. The one I usually give uh, is actually from the pact, where I learned you know, very early on, most of you know this, that I would never be called to testify against my husband in a court of law, but I would be called to testify against my own child. I don't know about you, but I'd be far more likely to put my husband away than any of my kids, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> you know, and, and I wanted to create a situation where that would happen. So in the pact, you have a mother who gets on the stand and has to either commit perjury or somehow incriminate her son. Um, the book that I am uh, writing, I'll be writing it this summer, it will come out uh, in 2010. Don't panic, the 2009 one's done. But um, <laughs> the 2010 book is about a child with Asperger's syndrome. And uh, he has a special passion for crime scene analysis and winds up accused of a murder. And the legal system works beautifully when you communicate a certain way. And when you don't, it completely will destroy you. And an, a kid with Asperger's is a very good example of how you would be I unable to communicate in the legal system to, to really have a fair trial. And that's why I'm writing that book. So, um, you know, again, that's another legally based book because of some, a discrepancy that I see in, in our legal system. I do tons of research. It usually takes me nine months to write a book. And um, it, what, what's split in that nine months and what differs from book to book is how much research I'm doing versus how much physical writing. 
Um, sometimes it's three months of research, six months of writing, sometimes it's seven months of research, and then a very quick two months. And even when it feels like it's taken 14 years to write a book, it's always nine months, just like having your baby. And, <laughs> and um, you know, for me, research is some of the best part of writing because uh, I always find my books um, changing during the research process. And I love living someone else's life for a little while. Who wouldn't like to do that? I mean, I have a pretty cool job. So um, I'll give you, for an example, some of the research I did for Change of Heart, because it was pretty intriguing. Uh, this book is about organized religion and the death penalty. So really, my research was bifold. And I began on death row. I went to the Concord State Prison that I just told you about, where, yes, all of the extra mattresses are in the death cell right now. Um, but they have not executed anyone in New Hampshire since 1939. Interestingly, on the heels of this publication, they will be trying someone for capital punishment this fall. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens there. Um, however, uh, you know, right now, it's not a place to go if you want to learn about the death penalty because they don't have a working death row. So I used literally every connection I had to get into Arizona uh, and their Florence, Arizona prison, which um, has their death, that's where all their, uh, their death row is. And uh, I went down there, I was flying out to Arizona, and literally I was in the middle of the country on a plane when they canceled my visit because they decided that I was the wrong kind of media. I still don't know what that means. But I got, I, there was no way I wasn't getting in after that. So I'm sitting there banging on the door of the prison, begging to be let in. And they did, they let me in. They took me up to the death row cells, which if, honestly, if they're working the right way, are extremely boring. Because everyone's locked down 23 hours a day. The guys are usually asleep. Um, they are moved singly, so they never cross paths. And you know, from there, I said, I really, really would like to see the death house, which is what they call the place where they perform the executions. Now, every, con every state that has the death penalty, oh, I thought that was my mother calling. That's OK. Um, <laughs> every state that has the death penalty on the books actually has two forms of execution. One is lethal injection. The other one, it, it depends from state to state. In New Hampshire, it's hanging. And theoretically, you could hang someone and donate your organs if you did it the right way. Um, in Utah's firing squad in uh, Arizona, it happens to be gas chamber. So I was in the death house, and I was standing outside the gas chamber, and I was literally flicking a switch that turned the microphone on and off in that room. And a woman walks up to me and asked who I was and what I was doing there. And I told her, and it turned out she was the warden, and she was not happy to see me. And um, she asked me what I'd been told by this officer, and when I relayed that to her, she said, well, I wish she hadn't told you that. And I said, well, maybe you could talk to me. And she agreed to speak to me for a few minutes. And the first thing I said was, have you presided over an execution? She said, yes. I said, have you ever attended an execution that you were not presiding over? She said, well, that's a personal question. And I said, uh-huh. <laughs> and, um, and then she said, she told me the story of a woman named Deborah Milkey, who is currently serving time on death row in Arizona when uh, several, many years ago, she was convicted for telling her four-year-old son that they were going to visit Santa. He got dressed in his Halloween costume. She drove him to the middle of the desert, and the people she had hired to kill him for insurance money met them there and murdered him. Um, her family does not speak to her, and she asked the warden if the warden would come to her execution because um, she has nobody else. And the warden said she would, not because she thinks that Deborah Milky is innocent, but because she's a Catholic and someone has to pray for her soul. So I said, you're a Catholic, do you believe in the death penalty? And she looked at me and she said, I used to. And she turned to her deputy and she asked him to get a binder off her desk. The binder was literally this thick. It is a legal document that tells you how you go about executing someone in the state of Arizona. There is one of these in every state. Inmates sue to get a copy and are usually denied this. It includes everything from how they do a dry run of the execution to how they keep the victim's family and the inmate's family from crossing paths during the execution to um, uh, where the physician is during the execution. As you can imagine, the American Medical Association does not condone having a physician there, and their names are not on the death certificate. You'll be happy to know they are actually much more hands-on than you would think during an execution. And then the actual mechanics of the execution, which were very interesting to me because it explained why the Supreme Court is currently looking at this as whether it is cruel and inhumane uh, in terms of punishment. In Arizona, this is the way it works. Someone's strapped down on a lethal um, injection gurney. They have a line running, hopefully, from their arm, but they will put a line in the groin or between the toes if they can't find um, a vein, because these guys are intravenous drug users, and they've shot their veins. And um, behind a black wall, this line goes underneath a little curtain. On the other side of it is the physician, as well as three officers who have volunteered to be the executioners that day. 
They are each holding a syringe that runs into that line. Two of them have a placebo in the syringe. One of them has potassium chloride, which is used to stop the heart. The warden comes in and reads the warrant of execution. When she finishes, she says, do you have any last words? That is the cue for the doctor to begin administering sodium pentothal, which is what is supposed to relax the inmate and anesthetize them. An inmate's last words are anything from, I'm sorry, I love you, mom, um, I hate you all. It's usually not much more than that. It doesn't go on for hours and hours. When he's finished, she says, may God have mercy on your soul, and she exits. When the door closes, that is the signal for those three executioners to push their syringes, which means technically and medically there probably is not enough time for the inmate's body to be anesthetized before he is killed, uh, which is why the Supreme Court is looking at it. Of everybody that I met in Arizona, not a single person who worked there believed in the death penalty. They all said that they would continue to do it. It's their job. But they have seen too many old and feeble guys be executed because it takes so long to get through the system that they're not a risk to themselves or anyone else. They have seen far too many recidivist murderers come back because their crimes didn't qualify for capital punishment because you have to meet a certain set of criteria. And to them, they said, it just isn't very fair. Uh, it was very, very eye-opening, and this warden wound up retiring unexpectedly one month later, and I like to think I had something to do with it. <laughs> that was one half of the research. The other half of the research, which also was equally fascinating, involved religion. I was looking at um, Shea in particular. When you meet him, you see that he's doing all these really interesting miracles, and I told you this, this priest shows up and starts listening to him, but nothing Shea says actually comes from the Bible. However, it comes verbatim from a document called the Gospel of Thomas, which truly exists, which was rejected 2,000 years ago by the early Christian church as heresy and is still considered heresy today. And would be very hard for a very marginal guy who can't read, like Shea, to get his hands on. And that makes things very interesting for Father Michael. And I needed to learn a little bit about the Gnostic Gospels. So I basically was lucky enough to do a tutorial with a woman named Elaine Pagels, who is one of the foremost authorities on the Gnostic Gospels. She's a professor at Princeton, and I literally chased this woman around the country, um, calling her on ski vacations with her son. <laughs> but she was very gracious. And one of the things that I learned, which was very fascinating, was that after Jesus' historical death, Christianity was a huge mess. It was not uniform. People believed all different kinds of stuff. They were all calling themselves Christian. They all read different Gospels. They all followed different apostles. It was just a nightmare. And people were dying in Rome, saying, hey, I'm a Christian. The Romans would throw them up in, into the lions. And nobody even knew what it meant to be a Christian. So this, um, there were many groups that followed many different, um, different uh, Gospels. And one of them was a group called the Gnostic Christians. Gnosis is Greek for knowledge. And the Gnostic Christians believed that being baptized, that was a really good start. But the truth was, if you truly wanted to find spiritual um, enlight enlightenment, it was a very private and personal journey. Nobody could tell you what to believe, and that included a priest. Um, nobody could uh, give you a gospel and say, read just this, because it was going to be different for everybody. They believed that man was not separate from God. They thought that man was a part of God and made God a little bit more divine, and that part of your spiritual journey was figuring out how you were like God, which, again, very, very different than you are so different from God that Jesus is the only way to be saved. Very, very different from what we know today as organized Christianity. So um, the Gnostic Christians believed all this, and uh, they were one of these splinter groups. Well, as all of this was falling apart, there was a bishop named Arrhenius who lived in Lyon, and he realized that someone had to do something fast. So he decided that he was going to decide what made you a Christian and what didn't. And he picked the Gospels that we know today in the New Testament. He picked Matthew, Mark, and Luke, none of which were actually written by Matthew, Mark, or Luke, but he picked them because they were all based off a single um, history of Jesus' historical life called the Quell Gospel. The fourth Gospel, John, he picked because he knew the guy who knew the guy who had written John. I am not making this up, okay? And those became the four cornerstones of Christianity, a very important editorial decision. Had he not chosen those, had he not said, this is what you need to believe to be Christian, we probably would not have Christianity today. But in doing so, a little bit of the baby was thrown out with the bathwater because some of the tenets of Gnostic Christianity, which looked at individual religion and the idea that spirituality might be different for everyone and that you had to keep asking questions to really find your faith, all of that was considered heresy. And all of those gospels were burned and thrown out 
until 1954, when two brothers were digging for fertilizer in Egypt and they found a jug. And inside the jug were 52 rolled pieces of leather that contained the Gnostic Gospels. They burned some for firewood. The rest they gave to historians, and today you can read them, they're published. And when you read the Gnostic Gospels, what jumps out at you is how much they sound Buddhist. They have these crazy little Zen things going on that look like fortune cookies. Um, one of the things that you hear in the book is this phrase, um, if you bring forth what is within you, what is within you will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what is within you will destroy you. Now imagine someone like Shay who takes that literally and is thinking, I have to give someone my heart. So um, a lot of all that, a lot of the, the research on religion, I had to do separately. And I learned a ton from that, too. And, uh, and it was really incredibly interesting. It took a really long time. But um, you know, I think the, the caveat always then becomes, you know so much. How do I teach it to you without making it sound like I'm teaching it to you? So hopefully, when you read it, you'll find you're learning something, but you don't feel like I'm standing up in front of a lecture and you know, giving it all to you like I just did. Um, OK, so here's the deal with 19 minutes. Uh, first of all, thank you for saying that. Um, I am really happy it's in paperback. And uh, I think it's an incredibly important book. And I am so delighted to say that at this point, over 50 school districts in the country are teaching it as curriculum, which is a terrific start. And I would ho I mean, the book's only been out a month in paperback, so hopefully that will continue. Um, <laughs> I'll also tell you that I get, really, at least a couple times a week, I get emails from uh, students um, or parents of students from uh, places where there have been school shootings. I had two today from NIU. And um, you know the one that always will, will resonate with me actually came right after the hardcover came out and we had the Virginia Tech shooting. And a mom wrote me to say that um, her, one of her sons had died in Iraq. The second one had died at Virginia Tech. And she wrote me to say that there has been this unbelievable outpouring of sympathy from people all over the world. And the only thing that got her through that week was that she had just finished reading 19 Minutes. And she kept thinking, he had a family too. And that, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of getting chills thinking about it again. It's, you know, you don't expect to change people, people's lives when you write fiction. But every now and then, you get a chance to. And it's a really humbling and amazing moment. And um, the thing about that book that is so resonant is that everyone was either a bully or was bullied. Everybody's been there. So you, everyone's got something to say about it. Uh, to answer your, your real question, which is about what do you do with the school district that's, that's being blind, um, you hope like hell that they don't learn the hard way. Um, of all the schools that I have run across, and at this point I've been teaching, I've gone into schools and I've, I've worked with kids with that book, uh, all over the world, I can tell you there's bullying all over the world because there are always going to be cliques. They're just called something different. And um, I always talk about what I think can stop bullying, what I've learned from meeting all these schools and from talking to schools where they have done a good job reducing that. Um, you know, part of it is that the word bully is a silly word. People think of cartoon figures. And, and it's not really bullying, it's meanness. Everyone knows meanness. You know, and even if they say they're not a bully, they know when they're mean. And, and making kids understand that bullying today is not what it was when I was a kid. Um, now it's sending someone a nasty instant message or in the case of my, one of my local schools, posting a web page where you could go and write comments about a bunch of girls that people felt were skanky hoes. And um, you know, that's bullying too. Also making kids see that they can't change the world. They know they're not powerful enough to do that, but they can change their own behavior, and that that has a ripple effect. And ultimately, the schools that usually succeed in changing are the ones where it's not top down. It's not the principal and the teacher saying, you need to do this. This is how we have an anti-bullying policy. Because frankly, we are all far too prejudiced as adults to be able to do that. What it is are the schools that are brave enough to say to the kids, we need your help. What do you think is going to fix it? And how can you be part of the solution? You would be surprised at how seriously kids rise to the occasion when you give them the opportunity to do that. I am happy to report that in all of the time I've been working with this book, only one school district that I know of has actively banned it. It was my hometown high school. Thank you very much. <laughs> it was because the principal um, believed that clearly I had modeled this school on Hanover High, which is a backward compliment because it was totally modeled on Columbine. But apparently, she saw her school in it. And um, she felt that I was trying to create a PR stunt and wanted some kind of vi school violence to happen to sell books. I think that's really specious given that my son goes to that school and I would never do that. But um, you know, th what I will say about that is that the teacher who was trying to teach his <laughs> curriculum refused to give the books back because he said he will teach that book if it kills him at that school. And I think he will one day. Um, 
you know, you can't change an administration, but you hopefully can put enough pressure on them to understand that closing your eyes does not mean something is not still in front of you. So, one more? Yep. What comes first, the ideas or the characters? Um, a lot of people incorrectly assume that I go through the newspaper and try to find hot topics. And I actually do not. That's, that's the backward way. It's 180 degrees across from that. Um, the way ideas come to me, they almost, excuse me, they land in my lap. And it, it's almost as if um, the things that I am worried about the most as a mom or a wife or a woman, or in this case as an American, they just keep, they're like a little splinter in my head. And I keep thinking about it and worrying about it and worrying about it. And finally, at the end of that, <coughs> if I'm still thinking about it after a few weeks, it's probably a very good idea for a book. And if I'm still thinking about it for another couple of weeks, characters pop up almost like little mushrooms, and they begin walking around inside this idea. And they, they create a plot for themselves. It's the hardest thing for me to explain to you is how the characters come, because I don't feel particularly creative. I feel a little insane, actually, you know, and, and I hear them. I hear them talking to me. And I've always said that, you know, the only difference between schizophrenia and writing is that I get paid. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the truth is that, that when you hear them, um, they, they begin to take up the banner of whatever it is that you're worried about and walk themselves through a plot. And that usually is the point where I go, whoa, stop. And I figure out everything I need to know to be the biggest authority on those characters. And sometimes it means going back and learning what their jobs are. And sometimes it means going back and learning about religion or learning about ghost hunting or any of the other million things I've learned about in the context of my books. But I need to be, at that moment, the best authority so that when they then start talking again, I have the resources to give them the words they need. And I don't know where, uh, I, I know the end of a book before I start. Yes, even my sister's keeper, I know the end. But I don't know how I'm going to get there. I know the beginning and I know the end. And it's really the characters who take you there. And there are times, all the time, I'll have moments where something happens in a book and I'm just sitting there typing going, oh my gosh, you know, because it's shocking me. I never expected that to happen. So, um, you know, to answer your question, it really does begin with the idea. And with, not, not even the idea, but with the discomfort of an idea. And for me, I think the act of writing the book for me is very similar to reading it for you. I may not change my mind about an issue by the time I get to the end of a book, but maybe for the first time in my life I've asked why my opinion is what it is. And hopefully that's what you're doing when you read the book as well. So, so with that said, I really would like to thank you all for coming out tonight, and I'll be happy to sign for you. <laughs> You want me to un un yeah.